Five counts. Over 80 accusers. A defendant claiming everything was consensual. The case that's been two years in the making. Today, we hear from acclaimed women's rights attorney, Gloria Allred, as well as several accusers, while also breaking down all legal aspects of the case. This is the Harvey Weinstein trial. Hey everybody, I'm Jesse Weber and welcome to our Harvey Weinstein special. For the next hour, we're gonna dive into all aspects of the upcoming sexual assault trial of the once renowned Hollywood legend. From the charges, to the players, to the defenses, we're gonna break it down for you. That's because when this trial starts, we here at Long Crime are gonna bring you live reporting from the courthouse and in-depth analysis on each day's events. We're gonna start right now with understanding how we even got here. The man who dedicated a career to entertaining the masses will be facing a different kind of audience in January, perhaps the most important audience of his life, a jury. For three decades, Harvey Weinstein served as a dominating force in entertainment. As the founder of Miramax Films and co-chairman of the Weinstein Company, he successfully produced and distributed numerous films, TV shows, and plays. Weinstein was Hollywood royalty. I'd like to thank Harvey Weinstein, the Punisher, that's his nickname. Harvey Weinstein, who believed in us, the Mishpuka Weinstein. Harvey Weinstein, a man of dedication and vision. A man who acclaimed actress Meryl Streep famously called... God, Harvey Weinstein. <laughs> Yet underneath the glamour, there were dark insinuations and rumors circulating throughout the industry. Comments that if you only listen closely enough, you may have been able to piece together the bigger story. For example, in 2005, Courtney Love provided advice to young women entering Tinseltown. I'll get lively with this. Harvey Weinstein invites you to a private party and enforce the existence of Or in 1998, when appearing alongside David Letterman, Gwyneth Paltrow used an unusual moniker for Weinstein. As someone coerced you <laughs> into being here. <laughs> Do you count Harvey Weinstein as a coercer? Uh, but he will coerce you to do it. And so, and so Harvey. Or how about in 2013, when Oscars host Seth MacFarlane famously said this. Congratulations, you five ladies no longer have to pretend to be attracted to Harvey Weinstein. <laughs> These are just a few of the rumblings that didn't quite make it to the surface. That is, until October 5th, 2017 when the New York Times published a bombshell piece detailing years of sexual misconduct allegations at the hands of Weinstein, namely him propositioning women into sexual arrangements in order to further their careers. The New York Times story prompted numerous actresses and models to come forward with their own accounts of sexual intimidation and assault by Weinstein. I was raped by Harvey Weinstein here at Cannes. I was 21 years old. This festival was his hunting ground. Gwyneth Paltrow alleges that when she was 22, Weinstein inappropriately touched her and requested a massage, then threatened to fire off a movie if she told anybody about the encounter. Model and actress Cara Delevingne claims she was pressured into Weinstein's hotel room after a meeting, only to find another woman. Weinstein then requested that the two kiss in front of him. Actress Rose McGowan delivered one of the most damning accusations of all that Weinstein raped her. A nightmare, literally a nightmare. And, and he will never be the same. Prominent figures in entertainment and politics called out Weinstein's alleged behavior, while others acknowledged that they should have came out sooner, like director Quentin Tarantino, who said, I knew enough to do more than I did. From 2017 to 2018, Weinstein's troubles worsened, not only would investigations be opened in New York, L.A., and abroad, but he was hit with multiple lawsuits filed on behalf of his alleged victims. Then, on May 25, 2018, the Weinstein story entered its next chapter, criminal court. Weinstein was formally charged with and later indicted on multiple counts of rape, as well as a criminal sex act in connection with incidents in 2014 and 2013 involving two separate women. On July 3rd, Weinstein was then charged with additional counts of predatory sexual assault and a criminal sex act relating to a third woman from 2006. Weinstein has pled not guilty to all the charges and argues that any sexual encounter was entirely consensual. Just because a woman makes a claim does not mean that it is true. And just because Mr. Weinstein is accused of a crime does not mean that he is guilty. The stakes couldn't be higher for the once great Hollywood icon 
as he faces the potential of life in prison. All right, now let's break down the charges. Currently, Weinstein faces five charges in relation to allegedly raping a woman in 2013 and performing a forcible sex act on another in 2006. Here are the counts. First up, first degree criminal sex act. That's when somebody forcibly performs oral anal sex on another. This carries five to 25 years in prison. There was an additional count of criminal sex act on another victim, but that was dismissed due to misconduct by law enforcement. Next up, one count of third degree rape. That's having sex with someone without their consent. That's potentially four years in prison. First degree rape, that's rape by force, five to 25 years in prison. Finally, Weinstein faces two counts of predatory sexual assault. These are the most serious. If a jury finds Weinstein guilty of first degree rape or the criminal sex act, they could also find him guilty of predatory sexual assault if certain conditions are met, such as if he did this to multiple women. That's why having the testimony of multiple alleged accusers is vital to the state, because a conviction here could equal life in prison. Let's bring in our guest right now to discuss this trial. Joining me is attorney David Ring, jury consultant Alan Turkheimer, and psychologist Dr. John Delator. Great to have you both here. David, I want to start with you. How is the prosecution going to structure their case when this starts up? Oh, look, it's, it's all about these victims. I mean, they're going to parade uh, six very credible women to the stand. They're all going to tell very compelling stories, and they're all going to have the exact same theme. Harvey Weinstein aggressively, forcibly commit sexual assault against them over a span of 20 plus years. Now, Alan, this seems like a monumental task because getting a jury here is gonna to be tough. We're gonna to talk about what the defense needs to do later on in the hour, but right now I wanna start with the state. What kind of jury does the state need here? They're gonna be looking for someone who's gonna to wanna to protect and identify the victims in this case. Some people have maybe made accusations about things over the years and no one believed them. And also, some people think that any kind of criticism of any of the accusers is, is off limits. Those are the kind of jurors that the prosecution's going to want, in addition to those who are just typical law and order, where there's smoke, there's fire, authoritarian type jurors. Those are the kind of jurors that might actually shift the burden and expect Harvey Weinstein to prove, to disprove the allegations that are leveled against him. And there is multiple ways this trial is going to go. Doctor, I want to turn it to you. It's our understanding that mental, uh, you know, the psychology aspect of this is going to be a huge aspect of this case. How is the prosecution going to use psychologists in this case? What can we expect? Uh, well, they would probably look at determining whether or not uh, he has a paraphilia, meaning does he have a sexual interest that deviates from society's norms? And if it does, then that shows that he's at a higher risk for continuing to engage in these kinds of behaviors. Now, I want to ask you this. Uh, this is very interesting, David, because we talked about the prosecution being able to call multiple witnesses. It's a kind of a unique thing that we have in New York, is it not? And the idea that these are special Molyneux witnesses. So what is the theory behind that? We talked about it with the predatory sexual assault charges. How is the prosecution able to put in witnesses who are going to testify as to uncharged conduct? Well, Jesse, here's the thing, and, and other states have this as well. I'm in California. We have a very similar law. And, and the law is this, that in, in sexual crime cases, it is incredibly important to hear that the alleged perpetrator has a pattern of engaging in that type of conduct. And so what the courts allow is to have what, what I call other Me Too witnesses who, who are allowed to even though he's not charged with that particular crime against that particular female, that female is allowed to come in and basically say, hey, he did basically the similar thing to me back then, and, and the jury's allowed to hear that so that it's not just a he said, she said situation. They get to hear that this defendant has a pattern, has a history of committing sexual assault against women. Well, let me ask you this, Alan. We're going to see the first day, okay? This is the prosecution's first day, their first attempt to open with an opening statement that grasps the jury. This jury is not supposed to necessarily know any of the facts. It's going to be very tough, but they're not supposed to know much. Now, what does the prosecution need to do in an opening statement to get the attention of the jury and win them on their side from day one? Because we've seen before that a, that a case can be won in opening statements. Right. They're going to lay out a roadmap, and they're going to say, this is what... These are the facts that we're going to prove, and here's how we're going to prove them. And 
it's going to talk about the pattern. They're, it's going to talk. They're going to talk about Harvey Weinstein and the type of things that he's done. They're really just going to prime the jury to look for everything that the witnesses are going to indicate to them. It's it's essentially an overview of what their case is going to prove. But it's going to be uh, very poignant. They're going to get jurors to really focus and. Some of these jurors, it's going to be a lot for them to handle, which is something they're going to have to address in voir dire. But they're going to—it's going to be very emotional, and there are going to be certain aspects of the opening that might have jurors in tears or close to tears. Yeah, this is going to be a case that gets a lot of attention. As I said, we are going to be there. We are going to be reporting back about what's happening in each day's events. Jury selection alone could take several days, if not a week. Now, when we come back. We have an interview with some of Weinstein's accusers. You're not going to want to miss anything. Stay tuned here on Law and Crime. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody. So we have an interview that I want to play for you if we have it. It's with Rowena Chu. This was groundbreaking. We had an opportunity to interview her several days ago. Her story made headlines several months ago. I want to play it for you if you haven't seen anything that she said in the press. This is groundbreaking. Take a look. And welcome back to the Harvey Weinstein special, everybody. Now, many of his accusers are famous actresses and models, but our next guest is someone who was relatively unknown until a few months ago when she decided to break her silence by detailing her account in a revealing op-ed piece in the New York Times. Rowena Chu joins us right now. Rowena, great to have you here. Thank you for having me. So I read your account, and it was just really horrifying. Uh, you were Harvey Weinstein's assistant, and you say in this op-ed piece that in 1998, during the Venice Film Festival, Harvey Weinstein attempted to rape you. You are sharing your story now. What is it like for you to share your account now? It's been an interesting time. Um, for a long time, I wasn't willing to come forward with my story because at the time when the story broke in October 2017, my children were quite young and I was very concerned about their privacy. And also I hadn't really spoken about the story at all to my husband and my parents. And so I really needed to take some time to kind of work through you know, personal and private issues about the story uh, before I felt ready to share. And I think it took me also some time to think about um, the relevance of my story, you know, as a sort of ordinary, as a private citizen, as opposed to a, as an actress, and also as a person of color. Um, I think the full relevance of that, those aspects of the story, has really only come out since I've broken the story. And I want to get into that because you mentioned the four power imbalances that ultimately led up to this. But let's just go back to 1998. You graduate from Oxford. You want to work in the film industry, and, so. and you were warned. You were warned about Weinstein before you took the job. What, what was said to you about him? So at my interview, it was clearly said that he would was a difficult person to handle and it was also said that you know he could be a bit of a pest sometimes with uh, with relation to sexual harassment but I think there's quite a big difference between uh, starting work for a boss who you think is going to be a bit of a pain in terms of sexual harassment you know wandering hands maybe requests for massage and really thinking that you're working for a serial rapist who's going right. to hold you down to a bed so there's a that that's an important distinction and that and you you said you were going to take the job because you felt you could right yeah. because I thought I could take on the challenge of somebody who was quite difficult to work for you know frankly I'd worked for other people who uh, were you know pretty senior in the film industry and they were not a walk in the park right so you know it was fairly common that a very senior person in film would be difficult to deal with but you know for what any young eager person that wants to make it in the film industry these sorts of abuses and they are abuses let's call them what they are if you have a phone or throw a phone or script thrown at your head right. you know that's not a common occurrence in other industries before the Venice Film Festival did he ever try anything well um, I had only actually met him one time before the Venice Film Festival he came to London for a screening of Shakespeare in Love and um, that in itself was a hazing process. You know, it was the first time that I'd met Harvey Weinstein and it was a sort of test to see how well I'd do as his assistant. And so prior to that meeting, you know, I was briefed to do exactly what he asked me to do. And in that case, it was just to sit in front of him. It was quite a simple instruction to sit in front of him during the screening. So I sat in front of him, but then, you know, as the screening progressed, I felt that my head was perhaps blocking his view, which he was directly behind me. And so I got up just to shift one seat over to the left 
left. And, and that's when he yelled at me, you know, yelled profanities at me. So, you know, that is a way of testing, am I going to be the sort of person who leaves the room and takes umbrage at being yelled at in that way? Or is that something that I'm prepared to suck up to continue to work in the film industry? But then we're talking about the Venice Film Festival, which is something that you were not prepared for. And, and you talk about these four power imbalances, which I found really interesting. How did that all culminate in that night? Why do you think that night something happened? Well, I think there were a couple of nights at the Venice Film Festival where I was alone with Harvey in his hotel room. And, you know, that's really the point of the greatest risk and danger to a young woman that works for Harvey. I mean, there, I think there is a certain level of public abuse that you get, um, you know, the kind of screaming and the things being thrown. Now, that all happens with other people in the room. But I think the actual, you know, sexual misbehavior um, typically only takes place when you're alone in the room. Uh, it could be early in the morning. It could be late at night. But those are the times when it is definitely most challenging to kind of uh, avoid and um, try to um, persuade Harvey to uh, to kind of back off. I mean, th those are difficult because there are no other witnesses there. I mean, he's not a foolish person. He's not going to try this on with several people in the room. And you had said in your account that after this incident, your life took a completely different turn. The idea of trying to report what happened, because there was an interesting part in your piece when you said that he likes uh, Chinese girls because they're discreet, but yet you reported and came forward and tried to push forward, but that, you, you hit a wall, didn't you? Yeah, so actually, well, when we, because I worked in conjunction, as you well know, with my colleague Zelda Perkins, right. and it was really part of, you know, we were both young women. She was 25, I was 24. So I think part of the strength in coming forward was in coming forward together and kind of giving each other strength and working through this process. But we did take a very dark turn down the road because I think we expected a lot more support from, you know, if, if we were able to speak with people within Miramax, we expected to, you know, blow the whole thing open, to be able to go to the police, to talk to more senior people at Disney. But, you know, it, it did appear that we were kind of shut down at every turn. And you signed this very restrictive NDA. You talked about the challenges of living under that uh, NDA. Um, and very scary. You mentioned how there were uh, p uh, potential suicide attempts. You decided to break that. Now, his attorneys have come forward and said that they might seek legal action against you. They have claimed that this was a consensual relationship that was going on for a period of several months. What's your reaction to all that? Well, let me put this question to you. If you're in a consensual relationship with someone and perhaps it breaks down, do they normally end in 30-page NDAs where you're escorted to the toilet, you're not allowed to keep a pen and paper, the NDA itself uh, barely refers to Harvey Weinstein by name, he instead he uses the pseudonym of the mutually designated party, and then we're not allowed to keep a copy of the NDA. I would say that's not a normal breakdown of a consensual relationship. There's a lot of people that are going to be watching this trial for a number of different reasons, but for you specifically, when it starts on January 6th, what are you looking for in this trial? I don't think there's a victim of Harvey Weinstein's that doesn't want to see him behind bars, uh, preferably for life, but at the same time, it didn't come through for us in 98. It's hard to see how it's coming through for victims now who are struggling to get successful criminal cases closed, but of course it would be immensely disappointing if... Um, uh, I, I guess the strongest cases are against him in here in New York, which was his home, and it would be Im indeed immensely disappointing if this case doesn't succeed. If you ever had the chance to speak to him directly, what would you say to him? I think, you know, I would ask him to take a good, long, hard look inward. Um, I know that he's consistently tried to deny um, all of the allegations of the various women that have come forward. Um, but, you know, I would say take a good, long, hard look in the mirror. What has it been like to come forward and tell uh, your account? Before you come out, you think it's going to be a very empowering process where you get to finally own your story and your voice is free. And a lot of the rhetoric around it has been, oh, you were silent for 21 years and your voice is finally free. But what you find is when you release a story into the public domain, you know, as I said in London, it grows legs and walks off on its own. Marina Chu, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story and explaining every, everybody what it was like what it's like for you now. And again, as you said, you are shedding a light on a different aspect of this case that you don't always see. As we talked about, you see a lot of the fame, you see a lot of the famous actresses and models, but it's also good to hear from another side. So thank you so much for coming on. It was an honor. Thank you. Pleasure. And now I'm joined by two more women who have broken their silence on Harvey Weinstein. Caitlin Dulani and Paula Williams join us now. Thank you both for coming on. We really appreciate it. Hi, good morning. Uh, each of your stories, I, I mean, 
are just horrifying, where you accuse Weinstein of everything from sexual misconduct to assault. It's disturbing. And as this trial approaches, I want to start from one of the last questions that I just uh, asked Rowena. This trial is coming over, coming up, and a lot of people are going to be watching for a lot of different reasons. Caitlin, I want to start with you. What does this trial mean to you? Well, this trial is is very personal for me. And um, so there's that aspect of it. It's very emotional. I want to see justice done personally. It makes me think of all of the ways that my assault has affected my life. It, um, it brings back memories of, of what happened. But it's also um, very important to me. I, I'm hoping that the justice system will finally catch up with our culture, with modern culture. I have a lot of hope with this trial that that will happen. And so that's very important to me on a broader level. And the stakes are so high. They really are. And, and Paul, let's fast forward for a second. Let's say the day comes, the verdict is read, and he's found guilty on all the counts. What's your reaction going to be? What do you think that reaction is going to be? What does it mean to you for him to be found guilty? Oh, it it means a lot. And I think it means a lot, not just to me, but um, of my fellow silence breakers and survivors. Um, but more than that, um, I, I think it means a lot to just women in general um, that can relate to this. And it's, it's, it's not just in Hollywood. Um, uh, obviously, Harvey represents, you know, th that part of it. But this happens in all industries with women. And so I think it's going to, I think it's going to be empowering and kind of freeing, uh, hopefully, for a lot of women. Yeah, it, it really is one of the biggest trials, I would say, since possibly the O.J. Simpson case. We saw uh, the Bill Cosby trial, which was monumental, but this one just feels like it started everything, and it's kind of amazing that we are going to be covering it in just a little bit. Um, Caitlin, we, we've ta I've had an opportunity to interview a lot of different women uh, who have been in this very similar scenario, and I find each story more chilling uh, than the next, but what's interesting I always ask is why did you decide to come forward? What was the catalyst? What made you feel that it was time to share your story? So, Caitlin, I'm going to start with you. What made you want to tell your story? Well, the 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 Me Too movement was an incredible support and very empowering. It happened very quickly. Um, when the story came out, my I was driving to work. My sister texted me the the uh, the story in the New York Times, October fifth, two thousand seventeen, and her next text was, "You should tell your story," and that was you know something from twenty years ago that had really affected my life. It was a really powerful moment um you know in those first couple months and it's and it's continued so it was it was really the other women that started to speak about this situation and i had no idea that there were other women um so it was it was it was huge it was um wonderful to feel that support and to feel empowered by other women coming forward with their stories. And they keep more and more women do keep coming forward, whether it's about Harvey Weinstein or other uh, individuals as well. Paula, how about yourself? What made you, uh, what, what, what made, what instigated this decision to come forward and ultimately tell your story? I took it as um, a, just an opportunity to finally um, just get this off my shoulders. I hadn't spoke to anyone about it. Um, and when I did, I never named names because um, I was so terrified um, of just even saying the name Harvey Weinstein. Um, when I had hinted before with other women that I knew um, had been through similar situations as myself, um, it was just an unspoken, uh, you know, deal that was in Hollywood where you just you didn't speak of it. Um, so when I I just it was almost just an instinct to jump off a cliff and be free of all of this. And so as soon as I, as soon as the story broke and it was public, um, I was just, I was called to it. I was already involved in the Me Too movement. I, I don't know if it had a name yet. Um, I was involved in the Women's March and, and uh, it kind of all came together for me that week. Yeah, and, and now we're coming to the conclusion or possibly the conclusion of his story. But I mean, his name, Harvey Weinstein keeps making the media, keeps making the attention, and I'd like to get your perspective on two different things. Caitlin, I'm going to start with you. I want to talk about the New York Post interview. 
Uh, I don't know if you had an opportunity to hear what he had to say, where he said that he it seems like the forgotten man, that he yeah. this is not how he wants to be remembered, and he's done so much for women in the industry. Your thoughts? Yeah, absolutely, I did. Um, I I was quoted responding on on World News. I mean, it's it you know my first response is it was sickening. It was as I've said, self promotion gone terribly bad, and um, it was haunting and frightening too that he would present himself as someone who supported women because in a way, if he did, it was a cover for his predatory behavior. Paula, how about yourself? I, I agree with Caitlin totally. Um, I got flashbacks of the Kavanaugh trial, honestly, um, and I, I thought, oh, is he gonna try and be a victim of this? And um, it kind of, it, it gave me anxiety. Um, and I just, I was kind of shocked that he would even try to go this route. But now, now I see that's what he's doing. <laughs> well, look, I mean, his name also came on the news because of this monumental settlement. The idea that the $25 million settlement where he would not pay anything out of pocket, his insurance companies would take care of that to pay out to multiple women who went out against him. Also, the idea that he wouldn't have to admit any wrongdoing in this civil suit. Again, civil, very different than the criminal trial that's coming up. But when this settlement was announced, uh, Caitlin, your thoughts on it? Well, um, I feel very strongly. Um, I'm I'm very much in support of the settlement. I'm actually a lead plaintiff in the cap, in the class action that negotiated the settlement. So I've known the ins and outs for two years. I know what the limitations are, and um, I've always felt, as a lead plaintiff in the class action, that I was doing this for all of. Harvey Weinstein's victims. And it is very unfortunate um, that big business and, you know, men with a lot of power can continue to kind of um, squeeze, you know, squeeze something like this into, into such a small, um, into such a small amount. And um, it was, you know, it was a really difficult thing to go through the Weinstein bankruptcy, um, you know, really limited what the settlement could do, but it is still something that even women who haven't come forward yet will be able to, if it go, if it's approved by the court, will be able to file a claim. And um, all of the women that were assaulted by Harvey, 80 plus, 90 plus, I'm sure many more, deserve some kind of relief and recompense. And, um, you know, there's criminal and there's the civil and it's really important to try to bring justice for all of these women in in both arenas and Paula how about yourself your views on the settlement um I'm not personally attached to the settlement um, so my views are more in general for the public um, I just want this to be looked at for what it is and I I would I would prefer it to come out of some kind of funds that affect himself and not the insurance company, of course. I, I just, I want justice. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm not happy about that part, but um, you know what, honestly, I'm, I'm happy that we're just talking about this right now. <laughs> no, and it's a privilege for us to actually have an opportunity to hear from, um, you know, you, both of you, as well as we've had the opportunity, as you saw, to speak with Rowena Chu. We've had the opportunity to speak with other women as well. That's really what this is about here, to give a voice and hear the other side of it. Uh, we have about a minute left, so I'd like 30 seconds from each of you. The idea of his defense here, that everything was consensual, the, his attorneys have come under fire, that they're going to look like they're uh, victim shaming, they say they are not. Your thoughts on his legal team and what they're, what they're going through. Uh, Caitlin, I'll start with you, and then Paul, I'll come to you. Um, I absolutely think that they're going to be victim shaming. I think that Harvey's lawyer already went on light nightline and um, and and you know did that. It's and it's 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 kind of old news, isn't it? Right. I mean, I really think that we will be catching up with um, what's going on in our culture with this trial. Paul, I'm sorry. Fifteen seconds. What do you think? I I, I agree. It's old news. <laughs> yeah. Well, listen, we're all going to be watching, and the one thing that I can say is you two have been amazing to come on and share your stories. We really do appreciate it, and uh, I know we're all going to be watching the same trial, so thank you both for coming on. Thank, thank you. you, Jesse. When we return, an in-depth interview with acclaimed women's rights attorney Gloria Allred, and she actually represents several of the alleged victims. Stay tuned. We'll be right back.
and welcome back to our Harvey Weinstein special, everybody. This is all in anticipation of our coverage of his trial on January 6th here in New York. And we're breaking down all aspects of this case, and right now we're joined by a very special guest. Renowned women's rights attorney Gloria Allred is here with us. She actually represents some of the alleged victims of Weinstein. So thank you so much for coming. We really do appreciate thank it. Thank you very much for inviting me, Jesse. Of course. Now, it's kind of amazing to say that Weinstein is going on trial in uh, January 6th. This case in your career and maybe in the past two years of was we've seen so much change whether it's the Bill Cosby trial now this where does this trial this case stand out for you? I think that somewhere between 60 and 70 or maybe more women who have alleged that they have been victims of Mr. Weinstein. Um, I represent one of the two uh, victims in the criminal case for whom charges have been filed. And uh, it's the prosecution alleging that they are the victims. I also represent Annabella Shora, who is an actress who uh, will be a witness uh, and uh, on the issue of whether there was sexually predatory conduct by Mr. Weinstein. And I may be representing someone else as well. So on the scale of where things stand, I'm thinking that more people have, more women have made the allegation against Mr. Weinstein than perhaps took place in other cases. Um, and b especially because so many of the women who did speak out were A-list actresses, uh, it appears that more attention was paid to what they had to say because these are serious allegations. And we do live in what I call the cult of celebrity where whatever a celebrity says is gets attention uh, on the internet, on television, in the news, because the celebrity is saying it, especially if it's a woman, especially if it has to do with sex or violence or both, uh, sexual harassment, it's going to get more attention. Yeah, it's definitely a lot of eyeballs are going to be on that. And the question that I have is, how do you prepare your clients, these women, to testify in front of the world because you have to prepare them for the idea that they are going to be questioned under cross-examination. Their story is going to be picked apart by psychiatrists. We see it countless times. We saw it in the Kellen Winslow case. So how do you prepare them for going in front of a jury and the world at large? Well, I mean, it always helps if you're telling the truth. Right. Um, if you're lying, uh, it's much harder to survive under cross-examination. Um, but it does take a lot of courage. As you're pointing out, a lot of people will be watching or hearing or picking it apart. And uh, it, it is going to be very tumultuous and challenging for any witness. I mean, nothing in life really prepares you for that moment, especially because you know, some witnesses may be testifying about events that took, year, took place years ago or that they remember from years ago. So they'll just have to do their best and they know what their truth is. And if they, you know, stick to what they remember and are honest about what they don't remember, uh, I think it'll be fine. How did they come to the decision to ultimately testify? All I can say is that they were very thoughtful. They understand that we all have, I believe, a duty to, you know, assist law enforcement uh, as they do a criminal investigation and to assist the prosecutor if, as and when, the prosecutor files criminal charges, whether it's a high-profile case or a no-profile case, can he be prepared to testify? Will he testify? I think that's doubtful because um, I, I don't think he will survive very well under cross-examination. So, uh, but as to my clients that are just going to have courage, you know, I'll be there to support them um, but, you know, they're going to be alone on the witness stand. Right. And I know they're going to do their very best. Do you believe, at this point, all of the allegations asserted against him? Um, do you believe that that could be the case, where there's over 80 accusers and they're all telling the truth? Or there might be a situation where some of them are jumping at uh, what other women are saying? Of course, the question of attention grab, money grab, which you just mentioned, is going to be a little difficult in terms of my clients because neither of them have filed civil lawsuits against Mr. Weinstein, so you can eliminate the money issue. The tension grab issue, 
uh, one of them, Mimi, she did the initial press conference with me, uh, but she hasn't done anything for a long time. And I think Annabelle did one interview with Ronan Farrow, and other than that, uh, I don't recollect anything else that she's done. This case is going to be tried in the courtroom from their point of view. Exactly. And so, again, I just have great admiration for them and commend them on doing what any and all of us should do if we have information and we're asked to testify about it. As long as it's not going to incriminate you. Well, of course. And yeah. it's and nothing, they have done nothing wrong, so it's not going to be anything, hopefully, but positive for the prosecution. Correct me if I'm wrong, you knew for a while that this was happening, or there were rumors in the industry, or there were insinuations or allegations against him? There are lots of rumors about well-known people all the time in Hollywood. Right. I, I'm not a reporter, so I don't go out chasing down rumors. Mm -hmm. I'm a private attorney, I represent victims. Someone comes to me, with a claim, and I think that they have what appears to be evidence to corroborate that claim or, you know, how I feel about them, if it's credible, and if I can help them, and if it's in the time period to do something, and if I don't have any conflicts and all of that, um, then I'm, I'm open to considering it. But I don't go around chasing out rumors or even passing rumors along because that's not that's not what I do. It's not right. Right. And, and the reason I ask is because one of the things that's come out in the media as of the last few months is you've come under criticism uh, for mm -hmm. having clients enter into these kind of confidential mm -hmm. settlements. It's voluntary on the part of the client if she wishes to, you know, obtain a settlement if I can assist her in right. getting her millions of dollars or hundreds of thousands or whatever it is we can get that seems reasonable given her claim. And if I can obtain that pre-litigation without filing a lawsuit, without her having to, you know, go testify publicly in a, in a courtroom or speak at a deposition, give her testimony in a deposition, answer written interrogatories, and go through years of litigation, then if that's what she wants and I can accomplish it, I will do that because I'm there to serve her. My duty is to keep confidential what my clients tell me and to help them achieve the goals they can if I can ha achieve that for them. A lot of people want to take away those the choice of a client to keep her privacy. In this age of the internet, people should know there are still some people who would value their privacy, who don't want their mothers, their fathers, their sisters, their brothers, people in their workplace, people in their community, people in other places of the world to know they've been raped or sexually assaulted or victim of child sexual abuse or sexually harassed. Obviously, some cases don't settle. Some cases are going to get litigated all the way to trial to and through, to a verdict. Others will settle. As you know, most cases settle before they ever get to trial. That's in any civil case with any, civil, with any attorney. Most criminal cases settle before they get to trial, so there is no trial. It's called entering a plea right. in lieu of a trial. So if that's not unusual. But some reporters think, and they, they know, they want to they wanna know everything. That's their job. OK, my job as an attorney who follows the rules of professional responsibility and my ethical obligations is to keep confidential what my client wants. Having said that, let me just make it very clear that even if a person enters into a confidential settlement, she or he, if whoever's the victim, always has the right to go to the police, always has the right to ask the prosecutor to file a criminal case and to testify in the criminal case should it's filed. That is never prohibited in a confidential settlement. Were you surprised it took so long, till 2017, for the story of Weinstein to come forward? Well, again, some people, maybe they thought they were the only ones. I don't know. And then, you know, it does kind of build. Once people start speaking out, especially A-list actors, others say, oh, I guess I could speak out too. I won't be afraid. Right. There are people who've spoken out that ended up getting sued by celebrities. Yeah, it happens all the time. So, yeah, so if they want to take that risk and they are willing to pay attorneys to defend them if they get sued for defamation, God bless them. They, it's up to them if they want to take that risk. I'm not going to tell them not to do it or to do it. How do you think this trial is going to play out the day to day? I mean, I'm going to be at the courtroom. I'm going to be watching it. This trial is going to be very different than anything we've seen. How do you think it's going to play out the way everything is set up? Look, Harvey Weinstein has a lot of money to spend on highly paid 
small army of defense attorneys. They'll be armed, you know, they're going to do everything to earn their pay, so it'll be attack, 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 I expect, on the witnesses, and we'll see how that goes over with the jury. So I, it's hard to say. I'm sure it'll be very dramatic at points. Other times it'll be kind of boring, but important. Testimony will be given. And I do look forward to justice for victims, those who contend that they are victims of Harvey Weinstein and can prove it. And just people in general are going to be looking to this case and saying, is this going to be a just result? And we'll see what the jury decides. I'll tell you one thing, everybody's going to be watching it. It is a turning point in the Me Too movement, and everybody really has an opinion on it one way or another. But I do appreciate you coming, speaking a little bit about what we can expect and also about your clients. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Jesse. Pleasure. Thank you. All right, everybody, we are going to take a quick break. When we come back, more analysis and in-depth coverage of the Harvey Weinstein special. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody. Now it's time to focus on the defense, because don't forget, Harvey Weinstein is innocent until proven guilty. Let's bring back our guests right now to discuss the defense. Joining me is attorney David Ring, jury consultant Alan Turkheimer, and psychologist Dr. John Delatour. It's great to have you all back. Doctor, I want to start with you. I think the defense has been saying that they are going to say that these accusers have engaged in memory recovery therapy, that these are false memories. How does that work? So memory recovery therapy is basically a catch-all term for any kind of technique used to elicit what, uh, what are forgotten memories. The problem is, is that memories aren't exactly a picture that we take of the event that occurs in our life. They are heavily influenced by our emotional states, and they can easily be influenced by the person trying to elicit those recovered memories. That'll be interesting how it plays out in a trial. David, let's turn to you. How does the defense, and this is tricky, how do they balance vigorously cross-examining their clients' accusers, what they need to do, but not coming off as a victim shaming? Well, I think, I think three ways. Uh, first, they're going to focus on any inconsistent statements the victim made, whether it's to the police or the media. They have, they have probably looked at and analyzed every single statement and interview every victim has given and point out the inconsistencies. They're going to uh, focus on post-assault conduct. And by that, I mean they're going to say, why'd you send Harvey Weinstein emails after the fact? Why'd you show him affection in an email or, or even have lunch with him again after this attack, this alleged attack? And then finally, the third thing they're going to do, hey, you're going to hear this the whole trial. They're going to say, this was consensual. You know, you, you had regrets after the fact, but, but you allowed it to happen when it happened. Yeah, I'm interested to see the defense because these are very high power attorneys. They are professionals. They are the best of the best. So it's interesting how they balance that act, which is not easy. Alan, I got to tell you, it, it seems impossible for the defense to find a jury that doesn't know who Harvey Weinstein is, let alone the allegations. How do you find an impartial jury? How does the defense do that? Because it seems, unless they have this trial on Mars, how are they going to find an impartial jury here? Someone might know about Harvey Weinstein, and then maybe they know about the allegations. But a lot of times, people don't trust the media. There's people out there that turn off the TV, uh, close the newspaper. They don't know much beyond the fact that he's being tried. And so those people could keep an open mind. And there's also people out there that have been falsely accused of something that might side with him. There's also people that just think sexual harassment, sexual assault is overreported, And that sometimes, as was alluded to, women have regrets and then sometimes try to turn it on and get back at men. So there's certain uh, people that might not necessarily start out in favor of the prosecution. Alan, just one follow-up question here. The idea of the jury, aren't they gonna be sequestered? I mean, how are they gonna be kept from knowing what's happening on the outside? I believe they are going to be sequestered, and they're going to be instructed. If not, they're going to be instructed to not pay any attention whatsoever to any media, any stories, anything that says Harvey Weinstein or this trial. David, I want to turn to you. We saw this kind of in the Kellen Winslow trial, that if one witness, one accuser is not as strong as another one, just a factor of how you testify is very different than anything before, doesn't that lead a jury to say, oh, well, if, that, if she's not strong, then maybe the other one's not strong, and it can hurt the prosecution's case? Well, you know, maybe, but but I don't think so. Look, you're, they're probably going to hear from six different women in this case, and, and some are going to be more compelling than others. But even if one is kind of the weak link, so to speak, I don't think that harms the prosecution's case. 
Well, it'll be interesting to see because as we talked about with Gloria Allred, there are these numerous women who are coming forward, providing their accounts of what ultimately happened, and we're going to wait and see what happens. Now, uh, Doctor, uh, we, I, I just want, I couldn't get a, one more question. I'll ask you real quick, 10 seconds. If Harvey Weinstein's guilty of this, what kind of persona is he? Uh, he's a sexual predator who uses everything about power and control to get what he wants. And it's going to be up to the defense to prove that he is not that person. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Appreciate your time. And thank you to everyone for watching our Harvey Weinstein special. Our coverage of his trial, including legal analysis and on-site reporting, begins January 6th. We'll be right back here on Long Crime.